Whitehead writes, quote, philosophy is the search for premises, it's not deduction. Such deductions as occur are for the purpose of, are for the purpose of testing the starting points by the evidence of conclusions. So despite a clear lack of premises, we still ought to work towards defining some terms before we get started. So I handed out uh, this, this first couple of pages uh, from uh, Dominique Ledet, article on citizenship. This is from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and I encourage you, if you're interested, definitely turn to this. It has some great discussions of those an outstanding bibliographical uh, reference as well. So what is citizenship? <coughs> Rather than reinvent the wheel, let's read the first sentence here together. A citizen is a member of a political community who enjoys the rights and assumes the duties of membership. Varieties of citizenship are explorable. Uh, including what I call active citizenship and passive citizenship, whereby one acts as a democratic political agent to affect changes in policy, then you're an active citizen, and where one act, one is a person or a class of people who, through no action of their own, are recipients of certain rights, uh, then they are a passive citizen. Others uh, through some of the unhighlighted areas as the difference between being a citizen and the difference between Right, the difference between being a citizen and a subject. A primary condition for active citizenship requires, I think, a power structure within a nation state that allows for the expression and efficacy of democratic political agency, either as an individual or as a group. A thriving democracy or a democratic state requires an informed and engaged citizenry, and I believe that this is even more important than the fact that Earth might require territory. Laidette suggests three main elements of citizenship on your handouts on the right side here, the bottom left. So let's look at these real quick. Um, so the first under definition is the concept of citizenship is composed of three main elements which I mentioned. The first as legal status defined by civil, political, and social rights. The second considers citizens specifically as political agents actively participating in the society's political institutions. And the third refers to citizenship as membership and a political community that furnishes a distinct source of identity. Now, the pressures of globalization has forced the rethinking of citizenship in the recent years, especially as it may pertain to global issues and non-state action, either above the, the, the level of nation states or below them. So above them, like the United Nations level, below them, let's say, like NGO level, uh, non-government organizations, other kinds of organizations above would be the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, International Criminal Court, etc. Uh, below them, NGOs, uh, you know, Doctors Without Borders, uh, Amnesty International, World Wildlife Fund, and like. For those interested in following up on these issues, uh, please uh, go to this website, read this uh, great article, it's about 30 pages long, and she goes into some introductory detail on, as you said, 3.2, the promise of transnational citizenship to get the uh, volunteers uh, if it picks your interest. Now, what then is the scope of citizenship as global citizens? This is so far all just about citizens as if you were part of a nation state, right? Uh, and, and when I said that it requires that, that's what I'm talking about. Traditionally, it seems that citizenship requires this. Now, using the elements and lay that one, citizenship as legal status. An example of this, as a global citizen would be the UN Charter of Human Rights, uh, which confers legal status upon each individual human being as a holder of fundamental rights. You've done nothing beyond being born, you're a human being, congratulations, you have these fundamental rights uh, conferred upon you. This is, these are legal rights. Uh, we have legal status, the, the fact that we have legal status stems from, I argue, moral status. That is, as moral objects and as moral subjects. If certain actions can be done that require consideration of the moral impact on beings, then we are what you would call moral. Sorry, let me say that again. <clears throat> the difference between moral subjects and moral objects is, is basically this: if you are going to be affected by certain actions, that therefore you need to be considered, and your well-being needs to be considered uh, in the decision-making process. You're a moral object. Uh, you're a moral agent if you are doing something. Uh, conducting activity that would be classified as moral activity. So political activity is just, if you're being politically active, that generally can fall under being a moral agent. If you 
are doing something that can affect someone else, then that person is a moral object. So as legal status, the mere fact that you're a moral object, you can get a uh, citizenship as perhaps a subject again. The second, uh, citizens specifically as political agents, um, political and moral agents uh, who can affect global change and global issues. Uh, global issues we'll talk about uh, later on. The third one is membership. Uh, this is at least twofold in my opinion. To be a member of a certain, uh, to be a member of a class of account of citizenship is to be an individual. Um, sorry, strike that. Under, under that. To be considered a member of something that counts as a citizen, uh, it's more important the, the qualities you have as an individual than the fact that you are perhaps a, a denizen of in certain geographical terms. The thing about geographic being a geographic member of a state or an area is less interesting, I think, to talk about with global citizenship uh, as it would seemingly be available to all of us as citizens of the planet Earth. Uh, but I argue that the boundaries that define global citizenship are more specifically conceptual than geographical. Right? So by conceptual rather than geographical, I'm talking about there are items or areas of concern that we may share a common interest that it's, it doesn't depend on, on where we live or what nation state we're a uh, party to or even what race we are, uh, but rather because we have a shared concern, that can define a community, that is a conceptual community that we then share interests and we can act. Um, before moving on to that though, I, I think it is maybe unconventional today to talk about what counts as moral objects and citizens in the way I actually conceive of it because you know, being a, a denizen of the planet Earth, if it counts as a, as a moral object and, and therefore maybe as a global citizen or that is a passive citizen, you know, that includes the sentient beings. I, I think that includes all sentient beings. Um, if sentient beings can be affected by certain actions, then they count as moral objects and therefore are in some ways passive citizens, I would argue, uh, passive global citizens or subjects. All right. So given that I argue that the boundaries that define global citizenship uh, are typically more conceptual than geographic, what sort of boundaries are we talking about? The scope of topics over which we can form global citizenship is at once the vagary or the vague totality of all human affairs, and yet the minutia uh, universal of what unifies us all is the human condition. As conscious, rational, emotional beings that encounter this world through embodied experiences, as members of various communities and complex relationships, and again, quoting Whitehead, quote, at the base of our existence is, I hope, the sense of worth, which essentially presupposes that which is worthy. It is the sense of existence for its own sake, of existence which is its own, own justification. That is to say that I believe a chief concern of any global citizen should be the preservation and protection of the worth and dignity of other beings. This is clearly not some project for a global democracy, some sort of grand planetary government, if you will, no, but rather it can be a foundational guiding principle that we can use to measure what sorts of topics need addressing by uh, global citizens the world over. I arrive at this as a foundational universal item of concern because it is, I believe, a concern that helps to define a commonality um, or a class of people, a demos. Uh, demos um, means a population, right? who are able and willing to communicate with one another and act together to protect the basic dignity of fellow human beings. That's to limit the scope of it. Taking a cue from Whitehead again, if we are to build a philosophy of global citizenship, then we ought to find a common starting point that is deeper than transnational politics, that is deeper than shared interests in material wealth or happiness, that is deeper than even presumed moral codes. Quote, the starting point of philosophy is the determination of that aspect of experience which most fully exhibits the universal necessities of existence." End quote. That's Whitehead. I believe that the fact that we each have hopes, fears, longings, anxieties, needs that are met and unmet to varying degrees unifies us in our ability to even begin to explore the awful wonderment of it all. To be a global citizen, then, is to be one of uh, to be concerned about one of these things in relation to a global community. That is not just as it affects you, but as it affects a global community. Thus, while legal status may make citizenship conceivable within a nation state, I argue that meaningful citizenship 
uh, much less meaningful global citizenship, cannot simply be legal in nature. What unifies a global community is a globalized focus on something that matters to them all. Whether they look to protect, preserve, or prevent, or provide something of value, it is a series of shared interests and common projects or inevitable effects of phenomena or that impact us all. Citizenship can thrive above the limitations of nation states. I don't think that's particularly um, controversial, but it's not something that I think you'll find in a lot of the literature. Uh, so, how, But how would this work? Uh, there's going to be impediments to, to this. Uh, national allegiances are inevitably challenged by such global thinking, but they need not be abandoned. Neither states nor territory of, are of central concern here, though they are players and places that need to be considered. It is the vertical distribution of power above and below nation states where global citizens can work towards shared ends. Because at the level of nation states is, I think, where we run into the most problems. <clears throat> Though this is achievable only through, that is, the vertical distribution of power and, and working towards global ends is only achievable through horizontal uh, communication between groups of people. Uh, if global citizens are to discuss vital issues, though, one of the arguments that can be brought up against this is that we then, it seems we need a lingua franca. We need to have some sort of common language to speak. And because we don't have one, that is an impediment towards any significant global citizenship or global activity. Uh, or we need a multilingual forum in which we can engage in this. And arguments or criticisms of elitism immediately begin to come in here because although there are many people in the world who are uh, multilingual, the vast majority of us are not, even though English seems to be something that's spoken by a lot of people, uh, we also ought not to presume that as a lingua franca. So how do we engage in this horizontal communication? How do we unify together our power towards certain common action? Well, uh, we don't necessarily need a lingua franca or even a multilingual forum, I'd say. Um, it may be a necessary condition for global citizenship to have that horizontal communication, but it's the shared expressions of, of common concern on issues like the environment, on issues like climate change or global finance that can serve as what Ledet in this article calls later on. Th these concerns, shared concerns, no matter whether you speak Swahili, Zulu, German, or English, uh, we can have the functional equivalent of a common vernacular by the shared concerns we have. You know, the CO2 level rising, acidity in the ocean, uh, ocean levels rising, those sorts of things. I don't have to speak the same language as you in order to share a concern and share a plan of common action. It's not enough to simply have informed and educated cosmopolitan individuals, though. That's where I began on this paper. I thought, you know, hey, this is a great topic to talk about because, you know, we're here at HPU, we talk about global citizenship, and this is one of our learning objectives, and isn't that wonderful? We want to create cosmopolitan people who can speak different languages and be able to navigate different cultures, and that's all important. It's completely important. I think that is a skill set that's vital for the success of your generation, speaking to the current students in particular. But that's not enough. It's not going to be enough. Um, a significant and historical contemporary challenge, or actually, before I move to that, um, it's not enough, I think, because we cannot yet see the horizons uh, whereby real global citizenship, as I envision it, can really come about. Uh, people who are educated with, with the hopes and dreams that this university tries to instill in you are necessary, but I don't know quite how to envision that properly yet. Now, a significant historical and contemporary challenge to overcome in order for any significant progress to be made towards uh, many global issues is the towering challenge of empire. Uh, imperialism as a project has been an ingredient in countless political ambitions throughout human history, uh, but the more successful of these projects have inevitably enmeshed those engaged uh, in the project into decades, if not centuries, of conflict. Um, this conflict is the inevitable result of the causal web that imperial projects um, ensues. The greatest opposition to genuinely objective adjudication of issues on a global scale or global concern will be nation states. They will be the ones really standing in the way, I think, of progress. Uh, in large part because some of the more powerful ones are competing for global hegemony, global um, power. They will inevitably build into any structures, that is the nation states, right? Nation states 
will build into any structure of international discourse mechanisms that favor, if not in some way protect, not only their own sovereign power domestically, but preserve their ability to impose their will over other less powerful nation states internationally. The prime example of this is the structure of the National Security Council of the United Nations, right? Uh, the design of five permanent member states unmistakably favors the dominant military and economic powers and alliances at the time that it was formed, right? So who are the five uh, nation states, right? We have the U.S., Russia, China. I think it's not a big argument or, or shocking thing to say that these are the three uh, main global powers right now. Uh, but it was unlikely that the liberal Western minds that came up with this organization were going to allow for a two-to-one vote on things that would favor non-Western communist states. Um, so when it was formed, Britain and France were included as well. And, and uh, there's no question that they have no greater claim to a permanent seat on the Security Council today as half a dozen other nation states, I think. Um, but power once held is not easily relinquished. India, Germany, Korea, Brazil, these are a few of the powerful economic and in some instances militarily strong nations that come to mind that perhaps deserve equal consideration if the metrics that determine permanent membership are to be kept contemporary. The politics conducted by and for states will inevitably only serve competing imperial designs to some degree, I think, especially on issues that require global commitments to affect changes for everyone's benefit, but at often greater expense to the more powerful, more aspirationally powerful nation states. So take the Kyoto Accords, uh, for example. Uh, the general debate about shaping global policies towards greenhouse gas emissions. The US and China in particular opted out of these treaties uh, in large part because they don't want to be strategically hamstrung by limitations placed on cheap or dirty energy resources that drive their economies and competing military industrial complexes. But the effect is that the other states, the, the smaller states, some of them refuse to participate if the world's greatest polluters refuse to seriously engage in strict cuts to emissions as well. The mechanism of cap and trade or, um, or placing simple caps on emission or in a variety um, of these issues is not really the issue. Uh, but the meteoric rise of the productivity of the West over the past few centuries was really only made possible uh, by the burning of readily available cheap, dirty fossil fuel that powered the Industrial Revolution. It's no surprise, really, that other nations want to follow our lead. We cannot, therefore, reasonably expect other developing nations to not want to follow a pattern of success whereby fast-growing populations require fast-growing industries, which requires not only, which seems to not only demand cheap fuels, but uh, fast-growing agricultural production, which in turn requires fast conversation of conversion of natural environments um, into farmland, like they've been cutting, cutting out the, uh, the rainforest in South America at, at, a, at a ridiculous rate so that they uh, grow more cattle um, and have more and more grazing land. These things in turn exacerbate the problems that we in a post-industrial world have dumped in our fellow human beings on the planet to begin with. The problem presented by the real and perceived inequity inequity of opportunity forced upon developing nations is real, but a sea change of thinking uh, longer term is certainly in order if our world is, is to survive the transition to a warming planet. Economies of scale that drive down renewable energies will hopefully assist in the demand for cheaper, but hopefully clean, uh, cleaner, not just cheap, energy uh, that's needed to drive what seems to be inevitable industrialized economic development in the global south. Uh, but the imperialism of nationalism on our minds must be rejected in order to think clearly and objectively about global issues of justice. A part of what I want to turn the conversation to with you all is to try to imagine ways in which we as global citizens uh, can begin to address something as daunting today as climate change. Uh, certainly nation states are going to be players in that, but again, I think the conversation has to be held above and below, and action needs to be above and below that of nation states. Nation states um, make room for certain classes of people within each state to pursue certain ends. Um, this is true regardless of the state of the ends. A global society of which we may aspire to take part, presumably, will also prioritize certain ends for certain people. As a liberalized Westerner, I envision that the ends that we perhaps all might want to pursue or consider as important would include, uh, but may not be limited to, the preservation of the dignity of the individual. And the preservation of the dignity of the individual is inevitably affected by global warming, climate change, uh, by 
um, global trade treaties that, that look at indigenous populations as trade barriers rather than as something worthy of preservation, all these sorts of things. So just by beginning with one small, seemingly obvious idea that human dignity ought to be preserved, we can actually get to an awful lot of global policies out of this. Um, in the long run, I think we should include all sentient beings um, in the consideration, but for the scope of this, we'll just talk humans. Um, but I cannot, sorry. In the short term, it would be utterly miraculously miraculous if we were simply able to protect and preserve individual liberties of our own species. And until we can make significant progress towards that goal, I can't foresee much widespread interest or patience for those concerned for the well-being and inherent dignity of other species beyond the abstract concerns. So, in short, you know, a philosophy of global citizenship is going to have to involve critical inquiry, shared critical inquiry, about the roles and responsibilities we can and perhaps ought to play um, as individuals. Certain issues may also fall under the purview and attention of global community rather than at state or regional levels. You know, I've already mentioned environmental concerns, climate change. I hope to hear some more from you. But, and, and this will be kind of the last topic I talk about, is global security. Uh, global security is an issue that's not just an issue for nation states. It's an issue, it's an issue for individuals as well. Uh, but whenever you talk about security, you're going to talk about threats, right? So what are the threats? You have in internal threats and external threats. Uh, now, I'm not talking about, you know, aliens invading or anything like that. I guess that would be an external threat to global security, but uh, I think we'd have to depend on their wisdom uh, to, to not annihilate us if they came. Uh, but that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, but when you talk about external global uh, security threats, you know, there are some other things like the monitoring of orbital space debris, uh, asteroids, those sorts of things. Um, but internally, more, much, much more importantly, uh, is you know things like halting the proliferation of nuclear weapons, significantly reducing current nuclear arsenals, building goodwill relationships between the peoples of nations, more so in some ways than the states themselves will help to ensure the reduction of hostilities that make wars between states possible. Um, we also, I think, definitely need some sort of international court. Um, I don't know that the International Criminal Court is the, really the way to go. The U.S. has not signed that treaty. Um, and again, here you have a, a, the global superpower, uh, shocking, not willing to compromise its sovereignty uh, by engaging in treaties that subjected citizens to laws external to this country. That's not a surprise, but, you know, some of my students here in, in my philosophy class, you know, we read uh, John Stuart Mill and John Locke. And John Locke talks about, you know, one of the found one of the reasons we have government, he argues, is that we, we surrender our right to adjudicate natural law in favor of uh, some objective adjudication of, of law. So if we as citizens want some objective adjudication or issues of justice solved, we need, I think, to fight for some sort of objective and, and I hesitate to say um, government, but some sort of institution that can help to adjudicate um, things on a global scale. Flashpoints of contention revolving around the inevitable competition of natural resources. Uh, this is uh, one of the surest um, really, uh, flashpoints for conflict uh, and, and internal global security uh, or regional instability. And it's not just, again, between nation states, but the, the individual human can have, have some effect on this as a global citizen. The conflicts over the Spratly, or is it the Spratly Islands in the South China Seas? Yes. Uh, Spratly Islands, right? Uh, the submarine mineral, ri mineral riches to which their claim is linked. The opportunities for our Arctic exploration is going to be expanding. Uh, the findings and designs upon the extraction of rare earth metals not too far from Hawaii. Um, so these metals are on the floor of the Pacific and the lack of universal adoption of internationally agreed upon law of the sea treaty, say by the U.S. and others, uh, will really lead to it, what I think is increasingly the number one threat to internal global security, is the competition of resources. Um, and you, so you have these major contenders for global hegemony, um, and, and they're obviously going to fight over these resources. The lack of water, I, I think Hillary Clinton um, recently 
out of this is one of the real concerns, and I think it is one of the real concerns in the next several decades. Uh, if not at least 50 years, you know, I, I think we can expect severe regional conflicts on water, with, on, on potable water. Um, and these are necessary resources. They're not, uh, you know, rare earth metals are not necessary. That's that's a, that's uh, resources of want. But you know, water, if you don't have enough water, yeah, you're going to probably fight for it. So we have to start planning now as global citizens to try to adjudicate these problems. Antarctica, in the medium term, uh, that's going to open up to development and competition of natural resources. It's an entire new continent, right? The global south, the global south south. Uh, this whole new continent. Not new, I shouldn't say that, but it's going to be new and open for development. I mean, it's going to be new uh, and open for uh, the raping of natural resources and fighting over them. Uh, with the capitalist mindset that seems to dominate things, uh, you know, growth for growth's sake, um, that expansive conflict, that it's the expansive development and, and conflict that will ensue, really, I think, comes from that capitalist mindset. Unless you know, to speak some heresy here, unless we're going to consider limiting growth uh, and not having growth for growth's sake, um, you know, unless we're willing to engage in that conversation, uh, we're going to face some real challenges. But short of a much larger planetary rebellion against the forces of the capitalist economies, based, based on growth for growth's sake, we all would still like to survive as a species, no doubt. And so other solutions must move us beyond what are repeated so often at times it sounds like platitudes, but international dialogue, recycling, smart resource management, and the like, um, to a more unified, eyes wide open understanding of what seems to be inevitable. Uh, conflict, scarcity of resources, um, overpopulation, the uh, proliferation of nuclear arsenals. You know, I don't know if it, even those who aren't from here or those who are from here, you know, Pearl Harbor alone I don't think it's a stretch to assume that there's enough nuclear arsenal in Pearl Harbor and this the ships that are stationed in there to annihilate the Western Hemisphere of the planet. That's just down the street, right? So as other nation states and um, smaller groups uh, try to get their hands on nuclear weapons, the, the proliferation of this is inevitably going to result in the use of these weapons. Maybe not by us, maybe not by China, maybe not by Russia, maybe um, not by Al Qaeda, but so by somebody. You know, with, with enough of these out there, they're eventually going to be used, and that's something we definitely want to avoid. I think, and I don't think the post Cold War generation has really yet come to terms um, with this, and I think that's at their own peril. Um, to wrap up, or at least to get to discussion. Conflict resolution and a focus on developing respectful dialogue in which we're always open to growth and not just engaging others so as to change their minds um, is something that's going to be necessary. You know, we have the diplomacy military studies program. I think that helps to, to work towards those kinds of things. Uh, I think HPU is unique in the way that some of the programs that it's offering uh, to try to address these things by arming global citizens, you all, uh, with the necessary toolkit to handle these problems, and not just as members of the nation state. Um, I think that's that's good. Uh, we need to continue that. To build a philosophy of global citizenship is to reflect upon these issues, um, not just alone, but together as a group, which we'll do real shortly, uh, in an open inquiry that demands wider participation of minds unhindered by hierarchies, national identities, and agendas, or limited in the scope of thought. The need for in conclusion, the need for transcultural thinking whereby contemporary global citizens can work towards understanding global others without necessarily having to embrace their philosophies or sets of values is, is something we want to move towards. The idea that a 21st century global leaders and global citizens will have to be able to successfully navigate a myriad of global cultures and ways of thinking while still retaining fidelity to one's own cultures, values, and commitments is, is crucial. Cosmopolitanism in the 21st century need not necess necessitate the decline of national or cultural identities, but rather truly allow for an atmosphere of mutual respect through understanding and being comfortable with the differences that define a multitude of value sets. Through rigid adherence to many of these value sets, sorry, though rigid adherence to many of these value sets themselves may not allow much room for competing ideals, people who adhere to such worldviews themselves determine the extent to which 
they can and will accommodate the tolerance of other lifestyles and worldviews. This is precisely why educating our future generations to be global thinkers is essential to sustaining peace and sustaining global development, since increased exposure and increased understanding of others works to, de to deteriorate the prejudices that many worldviews and peoples often have built into their view of others. Allowing for a greater role for pluralistic thinking from within traditions nurtures creativity within these traditions and leads towards a transformative development of future generations. Um, thank you, that's all the prepared notes I have. Um, and I'd like to facilitate a bit of a discussion about some of this. I've kept it broad, generic, uh, to invite more, more ideas from you. So, I, I guess I'll, I'll begin. What, what are some of your thoughts about how, well, how did you think about global citizenship before you came today, and has that changed at all? Um, I'd like to start there. Yes. Yeah, sure. One of the things that, that you said really brought to mind uh, as you started talking about empire uh, and nation states, um, just kind of what came through my mind is I see that as a very vertical construct. Um, and uh, the global citizenship that we're talking about being very horizontal. Yeah. Uh, so one of the questions I kind of came up with was, you know, does that horizontal communication, does that help to erode? The, the vertical constructs of empire, kind of in the you know the internet tribal sense. Hmm. That's a great question. Um, I think it does to an extent. Um, part of the whether it's the intended or unintended, I guess consequence or design of empire is the objectification of others outside of your empire, uh, right? And so by having open horizontal dialogue respectful understanding without necessarily embracing that by that, that inherently erodes empire uh, that at least the negative conception of those outside of empire uh, though I, I can't think of any view of empire that's really positive unless you start to talk in religious terms like the kingdom of God but God aside uh, I don't see that many positive uh, views of, that empire has of others so yeah Evangelically, the kingdom of God. If you're not with us here against the right, damn the hell. Uh, so maybe, maybe that even has the negative. And I couldn't resist uh, waxing a little philosophically about empire. I, I studied a little bit of history. I have a BA in history, but I never got to pursue history as much as I'd like. And I think uh, engaging in philosophical reflection about history and how it affects uh, things like human dignity is, is something that I'm reawakening in interest. What are some, uh, perhaps, some other views on, on global citizenship that you had or have um, that might resonate with this or contrast? Yeah. Well, um, I went to a school that the, was very much about global citizenship and the education system was founded by um, a Japanese was an elementary school teacher of geography in the 1900s, and it was during the time of militaristic Japan. So he, um, the way that geography was taught was very much root learning, and um, he really felt that there needed to be an education that focused, focused on the student's happiness. So he came up with this pedagogy of Soka, which is value creation, to create value. So the school I went to was founded on that and it was so much about the dignity of life of, uh, through your education, you should fully believe in the dignity of life itself. And then that, like you said, or like White had, White had said, right, that that would form the, the standard, right, to judge everything else. Yeah, because we're gonna need some sort of standard. And, and I, I, I intentionally began with that I think very generic but very fundamental value because we have to find something that unifies us. Uh, and if we're going to have a meaningful global, global citizenship or citizenry of which we are a member, um, what's going to define us? I don't think it's enough to say we live on planet Earth. Right? Um, 
there are values at stake here. And so that is, I, I think, the, the best one to begin with. Um, and from that, we can derive others. Thank you. Chuck. Uh, for me, it's all about, like, in my whole idea, because for me, I'm a social work major, so that's something I kind of came by. I was going to go into business, but I decided that it seemed more my duty. And that's the idea of global citizenship. And I feel like, in my opinion, it's not something that you become. It's more something you recognize, because by the fact of what you were talking about, of the definition of a citizen, we're all global citizens in the sense that we were born into this world. And I feel like it's more not just something that we can do to help the world. It's more of our duty to the world to, to basically do exactly what you said. That's kind of my whole idea of both citizenship. That's my duty to go out and try to do all this because I'm part of this world. And I like that. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think I, I would say I try to get this across in some of my classes. I mean, we all are connected in a causal web, um, and, and even our most mundane of choices has real impacts on, on the world, moral impacts. And so, you know, the example I use sometimes is my, my water bottle. Right. This is recyclable water bottle, and um, you know we all know how much single-use plastic items is, is leading to the degradation of the natural environment and the, the gyre of trash and two gyres of trash in each ocean, major ocean, you know, and how that's affecting sea life and, and, and degrade, degrading the dignity of their life as well. Um, whether you realize it or not, all of your little choices as a consumer, from what coffee you drink to how you drink your water, uh, to where you get your power from, and you know these are all moral choices. And so you're right. You know it is about recognizing that you are a citizen rather than becoming one, uh, to some extent. But that becoming, coming into your own, is a recognition and an affirmation of the empowerment that you do have. You know I think that's something that. A, a liberal arts education helps to instill in people, and why I think it's particularly valuable, no matter what your area of study, that in the liberal arts education you will get that sense of empowerment, that understanding of, of the avenues of action, of the efficacy that you, you do have that are available to you, have always been available to you. Uh, you just need to make use of them. And the fact that you now know that you are able to make use of them, that gives you even more moral obligation to do something about it, um, or at least to educate others. Yeah, go ahead. I just I have a question. And um, talking about like the whole idea of goal system, I mean, the thing that we're lucky enough to have is we have all these programs that allow us to travel. And uh, I mean, the fact that we're all here at a private school makes it so is that we're probably not from low income. I mean, well, I mean, we all know uh, financial aid and everything. But for the people that are, say, like, that are stuck where they are, you know, that don't have the ability to go out and teach everybody in different worlds and um, talk to people from different countries and have that have that opportunity, I mean, how are they supposed to exercise their global citizenship without, while staying in the same place, in the same area? Well, just because uh, your membership is global doesn't mean your activity has to be global. I mean, and, and I don't mean just the bumper sticker, act, think globally, act globally. Uh, but, you know, you, you, you act within the realm in which you have efficacy. Um, I don't know President Obama, so I'm not going to expect that I can really actually write to him and affect his decision-making process. Uh, through some of the projects I've required of my students, I do have access to Colleen Hanabusa, I do know Tulsi Gabbard, you know, I do know these kinds of people, and I can reach out to them. And, and you know, I have a responsibility to do that because I have perhaps some access other people might not have. But the villager, he or she has access to the elder, or to somebody else. I mean, everybody has access to somebody in power um, that can help to improve situations. Um, so, I don't know if that makes sense better or not. Yeah. Chime yeah. in on that. There's a lot of vast changing changes that are happening right now, and, and you know, how is someone like that going to be engaged in global citizenship? Um, there's a book called Abundance. It's by Peter Diamandis, and I can't think of the other guy's name. Uh, they call it the rising billion. And it's not actually a, a billion. It's three and a half billion people over the yeah. next seven years are expected to join the global connected community, whether that's from travel or from just the fact that you know, we're getting to the point where we have Maasai herdsmen 
who are sitting there with a smartphone and have better access to information than President Clinton did when he came to power. Those are the kind of places that that we're going to start to build this global leadership, uh, or, or excuse me, global citizenship, in, in my mind anyway. And my question comes up, you know, when you start talking about values, is that something that we should try and put out into the global world, or is that just something that, that will emerge? A couple things. Uh, on, on that comment about the uh, connectedness, you know, it, it, it's the radical changes that are coming every day and that are still to come that make me hesitant to try to envision too much what any global citizenship in the future really might consist of, um, first of all. Uh, as for values, you know, again, I think we can, and I think we should assume some basic ones like shared concern for dignity. But having that open and honest dialogue about what that means and how that plays out in your society or my society or in my power relationships or your power relationships, there's a lot of, um, what's the word? Um, there's going to be a lot of resistance to having that dialogue come back to critique yourself. But I mean, and, and, and we can see that even, even in, interpersonal, in interpersonal communication, you know, it's one thing to be able to give an objective critique of somebody else, but how well are you going to be able to handle the hopefully constructive criticism coming back at you? And so I can talk about dignity and how that is important for the rights of uh, men and women, and I can get somebody to generally agree with me on that, but then we can start to talk about the education of women uh, or the, uh, and, and not even the women's suffrage, but just the basic right to have an education or even the basic right to have access to contraception. The UN just today or yesterday came out and said access to contraception, contraception is a fundamental human right. They've made that, you know, which is not to say whatever they say goes, but, you know, a lot of people are going to have a lot of problems with that. But I think what that's rooted in, fundamentally, is a concern for human dignity and the right to be able to plan out your life and, and the space your children and, and the real impacts that doing that has for the economic growth of everybody in your village when you can control, you know, how and when you're going to have children. Um, so that's why dialogue is really important. And, and this is one of the ways I got interested in this, because I've written a lot on interreligious dialogue, and how do we begin to have an open, honest communication about religion. If I'm, say, I'm committed, uh, say, Catholic, and you're a committed Buddhist, and you're a committed Hindu, how are we going to really sit down around the table and have an honest dialogue about what's valuable in your tradition and what's valuable in my tradition? When we all think we're right and the other people are wrong, right? That's real. That's real hard to do. And so, you know, what I argue is that in order to have any honest dialogue, because dialogue is not just proselytizing. Yeah, it's proselytizing when I say what I'm saying because I'm trying to convince you. This isn't debate club, right? What we're trying to do is get at some deeper truth. And so, I need to be open to the possibility of change. And and a lot of people in the world aren't open to that. And they're not going to be part of that conversation that we can't force them to that. They have to come to that on their own. But those of us who are, who are open to that, who are open to finding value in your tradition and your tradition, and maybe you'll find value in mine, then we can engage in genuine and religious dialogue and change and moving towards uh, perhaps some greater spiritual truths that we might not have realized before. I think that translates into politics. I think that translates into, into um, social ethics, too. Um, but that's something I hope to write on in the future. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to say two things. One thing you were saying earlier about not being able, those people are not able to travel or have that ability. I don't think global citizenship is dependent on your financial or your standing or anything like that. Right. I totally think that no matter what, where you are, what situation, that person has the capability of, and this isn't my term, but imaginative empathy or, you know, uh, thinking of others being aware or having that you know empathy for others around the world and that can happen anywhere and um but like i think in your and what you said today you mentioned something about transformation or transformative power and like what you just said kind of made me think with dialogue if both parties have to be open and willing to maybe whatever they say they're not, they're not going to convince the person that they might be wrong, or not wrong in a sense, but they're open to hearing something different. And through that, 
that person, you know, that recognition or that becoming, that's a transformation in the person. And I think that's a transformation in both people and how they view things. And, you know, that's what goes out into society and everything else. Yeah, and, and, and frankly, that's why I studied philosophy. Because philosophy, I, I don't think it's just a bunch of reading a bunch of old dead white guys. It's, it's about open inquiry. And so um, the inquiry involves the inquiry into your own ideas and testing them. And, and only by testing them do they have value or attraction in the world. That's one thing to inherit your beliefs from mommy and daddy, but then to come to college or some other community and, and test those out and see how, how, how other people see those and how those uh, might have use or useless for other people's lives, then we can begin to have a more mature view of our, of our values. Uh, so, you know, that's why I, you know, I subtitled today's talk, it wasn't a thing, but as an open shared inquiry. It has to be open, meaning we're open to change, it has to be shared, it's not just an internal dialogue, and it has to be inquiry, which means um, really evidence-based, open to being wrong. And again, not everybody's comfortable with that. And we call it, you know, argumentation, but argumentation is oftentimes, I think, looked down as something bad, but I think it's great. It's, it's the only way we, we, we grow. Just through arguing, not fighting, but arguing. Yeah. I have a more question. Um, you're talking about like making a horizontal community better, like global citizenship. And I was, uh, I was wondering. I mean, for me, it's like when you have uh, an, a problem like global warming or anything like that, some global issues. I feel like for a lot of people, it doesn't really become real to them until it becomes a personal thing for them. So a lot of people, they feel like they can go and drive their Hummers and they can do all this. And for them, I mean, regardless of what they do, it's, if it makes issues on the other side of the world that they don't know about, it's not a personal thing for them. So how do we kind of, and it seems like for, for people to get personal, they won't actually make it an issue until it hits them close to home. You know? yeah. And so how do we make it personal without having it hit them close to home? I don't know. I mean, that's, there, that's, that's, the, that's one of the sad things of human nature is we're often unwilling or unable um, to, actually I would say unwilling to really uh, think about that sort of stuff. Um, well, I brought in an editorial comment that you brought up on climate change. It's one of my favorites. It's on a global, global uh, climate summit. And there's a skeptic there and he says, well, you know, what if it's all just a big hoax and we make the world a better place for nothing? I mean, imagine that. You know, but this is something that people say. What if we make the world a better place for nothing? Like, whoa, wait a minute. As global citizens, we want to improve the world. We want to improve uh, access to dignity and preservation of dignity. Um, and you know what? There's going to be some people who benefit from that. And you know what? There's going to be some people who pay a higher cost for that. But I'm willing to say I don't care. Yeah, you know what? If we start giving uh, financial incentives to people for not cutting down rainforests, they're going to benefit from that. So what? We all benefit by having the rainforest and having carbon offset. Um, yeah, they might get more money in their villages for not hunting um, uh, and killing wildlife and, and taking their tusks and selling them to the Chinese who want to use them ground up in powder, whether it's tigers or elephants. Yeah, give them, if that's what it takes, if it takes that kind of financial incentive, oh, what if we create a better world and other people benefit and I don't? I think that's completely wrong-headed. And improving the world, and, and I, don't know, I don't know that it's exactly a Western thing, but we have this wrong-headed view that it's a zero-sum game, that somehow if somebody else benefits, I lose. And that's not true, man. That's just not the way it is especially on issues of global concern like climate change, like global finance, um, um, like human trafficking. We all win when we address these issues. And some have to pay more, and some will get more out of it. That's okay. Great. Because we're serving, again, something we can all agree on, dignity. Yeah? we address yeah. maybe redistribution of wealth? And, uh, or is that necessary? Maybe to rephrase your question a bit? Well, well first of all, I don't, if I did say that, I didn't mean to. I don't think we need to sacrifice sovereignty. Uh, I don't think we need to sacrifice the sovereignty of nation states. I do think that 
that's not the only matter of concern on global issues, though. But by and large, they're the big players. They're the ones who are in dialogue. They're the ones who have APEC conferences and UN conferences and Asian Development Bank conferences. And so they're the ones who tend to be represented. And so obviously they're concerned about their own sovereignty and the wealth of the business people that they represent. That's one thing. I don't know that we're going to change that. But as for the relationship between wealth and, and, and by wealth I don't mean actually being rich, but the relationship between wealth and dignity, uh, yeah, that is something that we have to address. And, and, and you know, just to use the terminology that I think we'll find many world leaders using, um, creating opportunities for pe economic opportunities where people will address those things. You know, capitalism itself I don't think is evil. Um, I don't know that we've had pure capitalism uh, per se in many places on this planet, but it can be used for good. You can have microfinancing. I, I engage in microfinancing. I, uh, you, can, you can lend money, small amounts of money to people in the third world uh, who need this one lady in Bolivia. I, I, I forget what's it called. Kiva? Yeah, or yeah. Kiva? Yeah. Uh, one of the things I, you know, so like 12 people, if they can lend 25 bucks, this lady can get enough money to build an additional room in her home for her and her family so that it improves their dignity and self-worth and allows them to grow their family and, and just live a better life. Or, you know, there's people who need to reinvest in the capitalization of their um, you know, coffee business or something like that. These little things which give access to economic tools that we tend to really only have as wealthy people in the West, but it allows these people to have access and allows capitalism in a good way to grow and to provide economic opportunity and growth. Um, that's one way. I, I'm not an economist. But I, I don't think that's the only way. Um, I don't think we just need to give money to people. Um, but we do need to create opportunities, or at least respect ways of life that don't rely upon um, our capitalistic notions of, of work and wealth. Um, you know, indigenous populations world over are terrorized by um, transnational corporations coming in and saying, no, 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 stop doing this diverse stuff. Just grow chocolate, just grow coca. Right? And you're going to be rich. You're all going to be great. So everybody, you know, quits their jobs, or people buy it bland. They just plant coca, and then you know, someday comes along, and, and the coca market falls, and then they all suffer, and they they lose their family farms, or they don't have a job, they can't feed their children, and they're all screwed because they've been engaged in this global capitalism. Whereas if we allow different countries, nation states, or communities to develop sustainable economies on their own, that, more than money, will ensure dignity. You know, we, I know we're almost near the end here, we in the islands import 85% of our food. We're by no stretch of the imagination poor. Uh, but, you know, if there's some sort of problem, natural disaster, or, or financial disaster even, and the mats and ships stop coming in, we're screwed. Because we're not diversified or we're not sustaining ourselves. That kind of pattern happens the world over to these countries that uh, say they, they need some money to develop uh, infrastructure. And so they go to the World Bank and they say, look, we need a loan. And the World Bank says, fine, we'll give you this loan, but you have to restructure everything from the way you do your taxes to the entitlements that you give to your people. Reduce what you give, increase what you take, and you know, start to simplify your economy. That is, stop diversifying. And once they do that, they become absolutely dependent upon the global market. And, and they can no longer really get back to sustainability. And so it's really the structures and the patterns of development that I think is more important than the actual amount of money that people have in their pockets. I'll, I'll end with that. All right, thank you, Dr. President. Thank you for a great and very engaging talk, and hopefully